Hugh White, why has Australia spent the last couple of decades building the wrong Australian Defence Force? Well, because we've had the wrong conception of our strategic objectives. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, we've inherited from the 1970s and 1980s the idea that our Defence Force should be designed for the self-reliant defence of Australia against a small, not very capable regional power, Indonesia. And that on top of that, we want to be able to do a little bit of regional stabilisation, East Timor, Solomon Island sort of stuff, and do a bit to support the United States in operations far away, Iraq, Afghanistan, that sort of thing. And then on top of that, we've, laid, we've, we've overlaid a fourth imperative, and that is the idea we should be able increasingly to support the United States in a major power conflict in Asia, and that's led us to uh, some more ideas. So there's a wide range of different things we've been trying to make our Defence Force do. And if you look at the big investments, you look at where the, the, the major money has gone, a great deal of it has gone into that last one, that is building the capacity for the ADF to get back into the traditional business of projecting major land forces overseas to support our allies in a major conflict. And I don't think that's a viable military strategy for Australia because I don't think we're going to be able to achieve the sea control and I don't think our, our land forces are big enough to have any strategic impact. So I think we need to rethink our military strategy, uh, focus, focus it overwhelmingly on maritime denial, both of our own approaches and the approaches to our neighbours, and that would drive us towards a very different kind of force structure, bigger in some areas, much smaller in others. If you start that trend from the 2000 Defence White Paper that you wrote for John Howard, uh, the question is, Hugh White, what is your mea culpa? Uh, my mea culpa, and it's something I have thought about quite a lot, is not to have pushed harder for a bigger adaptation of the force structure. We did start in, uh, in 2000 to acknowledge that the constructs which had served us so well in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, the, the narrow focus on the defence of Australia was a sufficient basis for, um, to, for defining Australia's strategic objectives and therefore through that what our forces needed to be able to do. But in the 2000 White Paper we began to broaden that out by defining Australia's strategic interests and objectives more broadly. And we did that quite explicitly in that what people often now call the concentric circles hierarchy. That's 2000 White Paper was where that first emerged. And my conception, the conception of strategic objectives that I set out in the book are uh, uh, very much modelled on that conception. I, think, I still think that's basically the right way uh, to think about it. But what I didn't realise then, and I feel a bit guilty about this, was how quickly Chinese power would rise how quickly America's capacity to respond would erode, partly thanks to 9-11 and all of that sort of stuff. And therefore, how fast we should be moving, not just to expand our capacity to support the United States in a conflict with China, but to expand our capacity to defend Australia independently if that failed. And, and you know, I think we just, I, I underestimated how fast things were going to change. My only consolation is that I think uh, most other people in Australia have underestimated that much more, and many of them are still underestimated. One of the things that you abandon is the overall commitment to Australia's expeditionary culture to do our part to maintain the global balance. You're saying Australia should no longer be thinking in terms of the global balance. We should be thinking only in terms of the balance we can bring to the Indo-Pacific. Yes. Look, I don't think Australia's ever made since at least since the Second World War, and arguably even since the First World War, has Australia ever made a significant contribution to the global balance? And in particular, after Vietnam, we stepped back from that. Now, the, the rhetoric that governments have used to describe to the Australian public what we've been doing in the Middle East at various stages has, had, uh, has, has used phrases like the global balance or global values and so on. But the reality is that the key motive that, for that has been to burnish our credentials as a strong US ally in order to reinforce our confidence in US willingness to support us in our part of the world. So I, I, I don't think we're really stepping back from much there. I think we're more abandoning a bit of rhetoric that uh, has, uh, has passed its use by date. The headline version of your suggested force structure is sink the Navy, start again, shrink the Army, double the Air Force. Yes. 
unpack the headline. Right. Well, the, 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 the Navy is in some ways the most startling because I, if, you, if you move to a strategy of maritime denial, if you step back from the idea that we're going to be focusing on projecting power by sea, then you don't need the big amphibious ships and nor do you need the, the big, very expensive major surface combatants, the air warfare destroyers and the future frigates which are bought uh, at the same, which are being bought now, uh, whose only really core role is to defend the amphibious ships. So you just don't need them. In a strategy of maritime denial, you do have and need submarines, and you need a lot more of them. Uh, because submarines are, when you get beyond the range of land-based air power, submarines are by far and away the most cost-effective way to find and sink an adversary ships. And the more of them you have, the better. Now, my argument in the book is for 24 or 32 submarines. That's a very big fleet, twice the size of what we're now planning, four times the size of what we've got at the moment. But then again, we shouldn't be surprised that we need a different force structure in an era where we're asking our defence force to do something very different from what's done before. And, and I have an, an argument in the book as to why you need so many submarines. It's to do with how many boats you need in the inventory in order to sustain six or eight submarines on, on, in service in the operational areas after a long transit. And uh, it's a big number, but that's the, where our geography takes us. In the Army, very difficult question. Australians, for the reasons we've discussed in other sessions, have got a very deep emotional attachment to the Army. But in an era in which we cannot com confidently uh, expect to be able to achieve the sea control required to deploy the Army as an expeditionary force, it makes no sense to build an Army for high-level expeditionary operations. We will need and should have the capacity to deploy our army for stabilisation operations, particularly in our immediate neighbourhood. But on those operations, the sea space is not contested. Against any major or even substantial middle power, we must expect the sea space to be contested. So the army's role in those situations is at home on the continent. Now, there is an argument that you need quite a big army at home on the continent in order to raise the level of forces that an adversary would need to deploy if they were going to seize and hold a portion of the continent, let alone all of it. And I, I have some sympathy for that. But when I ask myself, what, what is the most cost-effective way for Australia to respond to a lodgement on the continent? Um, we do just have to face the challenge that a very big continent with a very uh, poor infrastructure across much of it makes it very hard for for us to deploy significant land forces quickly enough to meet a lodgement. And I therefore think the best way to do that is, is, is I'm more inclined to use, to, to, to see us using air and missile forces to attack a lodgement rather than to use ground forces in a traditional But you, your end point is essentially an Australian army that couldn't really go anywhere but Australia. That's right. Um, not, f not for high level operations. And, and that's a very, it's an uncomfortable conclusion to reach. But I just make the point that the only reason we've been able to deploy our army overseas so often in our history is that our great and powerful friends have always been the globally dominant maritime power. And if that's not true anymore, then an army which is designed for expeditionary operations which can't get offshore because it can't, because its security at sea can't be guaranteed is not an army that's going to be any use to us. Leaving aside the question as to whether the army, when it gets there, is going to be big enough to do anything. You're arguing that the sort of defence force you're talking about is going to need a, a doubling of the budget, going towards three and a half to yes, four percent. Three and a half to four percent. There, there are already arguments that, in fact, what you're des describing, you couldn't get it for that. It costs even more than that. And, but it, it comes, I think, in a way to a very interesting argument you make. Um, and people, I think, are misunderstanding this. The argument that Australia might decide not to do yeah. that, might yeah. decide not to spend the money, because it's an awful lot of money. Yeah. Um, but it's an interesting thought that rather than stepping up to spending huge amounts yeah. of the budget, yeah. that you decide to go yeah. in another direction. Uh -huh. What sort of Australia decides not to embrace that sort of Fortress Australia big spend on its, on its Navy and its Air Force? Well, it's an Australia that decides that the risks that it faces in future the, the risk of American leadership collapsing and the risk if that happens that China turns out to be not a soft and cuddly benign regional hegemon but a threatening regional hegemon 
or that Indonesia does t turns out to be, when it's the fourth biggest economy in the world, an easy to get on with neighbour, or that India doesn't become a problem. In other words, it's Australia that, 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 that believes that our geographical situation and the trend of global and regional events means that the risk to us of facing a significant military challenge in the next, say, 50 years is not high enough to justify spending three and a half or four percent of GDP. Now that would that that would be a perfectly legitimate judgment to make, uh, but how legitimate it is depends on how you make that that future risk assessment. Now that's incredibly hard to do. We we have no reliable way of predicting these future things, and indeed you could say in some ways that a judgment on Australia's future defence spending is a gamble on the future of the international order. If, if, if we end up with a regional order in Asia in which the United States is playing a much smaller role, in which China becomes the dominant power in East Asia, in which it chooses to, to exercise its power in an assertive or even aggressive way, then 3.5% of GDP will look like a bit of a bargain. If on the other hand we end up with an Asia in which I turn out to be wrong, America continues to dominate Asia the way it has in the past, uh, China accepts America's leadership, the Indians stay in their box, then 3.5% will look like a waste of money. We can't know that, well, we have, but we have to make a decision now. So we have to make a prudent judgment about, uh, about uh, future trends. And in the book, I, I don't actually come down and say we should spend 3.5% of GDP. I, I say that we should consider very carefully where we are, because one thing is for sure, if a bad outcome happens, then the 2% of GDP we're spending, particularly the way we're spending it now, will not leave us with military options to look after ourselves. Either course ends up with a very different Australia that yes. thinks about itself yes. very differently, whether That's it right. doubles the defence budget or decides it's not going to That's do right. that. Yeah. Uh, what sort of Australia is that? Well, it's an Australia which you might say has finally uh, come out from under the protective shield of Western global dominance. You know, the, 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 the country, the society, that was superimposed on this continent in January of 1788 was entirely based on the proposition of British global maritime preponderance. That's why they were here. And it was British maritime power and the extraordinary British economy behind it, which had, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, by a bit of a fluke, become the world's biggest economy, that, that made Britain powerful enough to you know, discover, occupy, develop, populate and defend the society that was superimposed on this continent. And then when British power collapsed, American power more or less magically took its place. Now Australians have got used to thinking that, that being protected by an Anglo-Saxon power with whom we feel all of those you know, well-rehearsed phrases we get in every Osman communique, the sh shared history, culture, values, tradition, language, etc. We just take it for granted that, that we will always have uh, a very close alliance relationship with a country which is the world's biggest economy, the world's primary maritime power, the strongest strategic power in Asia, and committed to our defence. Because that's been true for 200 and something, 30 years. But actually, it's a bit of a historical fluke. So for the first time in our history, since European settlement, we are facing the idea of making our way in an Asia which is not made safe for us by Western power because the rise of China is the end of the era of Western dominance which began with the Industrial Revolution. It's as big as that. Hugh White, thank you.